Welcome to Central Baptist Church of Livingston, Texas. We're glad that you've chosen to study God's Word with us today. We'd invite you to visit our website, centrallivingston.com, to learn more about our mission to preach, to teach, and to live the gospel for the glory of God. Now, open your Bible or your Bible app and study God's Word with us. Great testimony, one of our own, right? And I uh, wanted you to hear that this morning. It is 9-11, and uh, 21 years ago, isn't it hard to believe for many of us in this room, it's hard to believe it's been that many years uh, since that uh, event took place um, for young people in this room, students, children, they read about it in history books. But uh, for us who were adults uh, over that age, we lived it and um, really profoundly impacted our country. We want to have a time of prayer um, now, and uh, we want to go to the Lord. So if you want to come forward, you can. You can join me here at the front. You can come on now, um, or you can stay seated, or you can kneel where you're seated seated uh, there in your seats. Um, but let's pray. Let's, we want to have a word of prayer for our nation on this day um, that is significant. Um, we also want to uh, pray for our first responders and all those who serve uh, across our country in those particular um, uh, settings. Um, So let's have a word of prayer uh, for them and for our nation. God, as we come to you this morning, we thank you that when we read the Bible, tragedy, suffering, heartache, pain, Lord, is not where you leave us. Uh, Your word in the Old Testament, Lord, points us to the the truth and the reality, God, that um, we may walk through seasons of mourning in our life, But those mornings, those seasons of mourning, turn into joy. Um, We're reminded of that truth. We're also reminded of the words of Psalm 23, um, that that though we we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we do not fear evil, for you are with us. You also lead us to green pastures. God, we thank you. that evil does not have the last word. No matter, Lord, what we experience on a, on a national scale or a global scale or in our personal lives, that evil never has the last word. And that, God, you are always with us. You never forsake us. You always uh, stay with us and walk with us. And you bring us back to the very thing that never changes. For you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And your word is what, Lord, reminds us of that truth, but always also reminds us uh, that, God, you uh, have a better day ahead um, that lies ahead. And so, God, thank you for that reality and thank you for that truth this morning, Lord. We do love you and thank you for the power of testimonies. It encourages us. It inspires us. It speaks into our lives, Lord, whether they're baptisms or whether it's a personal testimony. We thank you, God, for, for those things. God, we pray for our nation on this day. We pray for our our country. We pray, God, for our government leaders, that, God, you would give them wisdom today, uh, that you would, Lord, guide them on this day. Um, God, we pray that you would, Lord, move among all of our first responders, uh, whether they're firefighters or police or fire and rescue or FEMA, uh, other agencies and other groups of men and women. God, we pray for you uh, on this day to protect them, We pray on this day that you would provide everything that is needed for them to do their their jobs, to protect and to serve our country and our communities. Father, we just lift them up to you in every way. We pray most importantly, Lord, that they would meet Jesus, that they would meet you. Uh, For God, Lord, the, um, the pressures of the things that our first responders have to experience and deal with daily and weekly and monthly, Lord, are sometimes horrific. And God, we pray that God, they would turn to you, that they would find rest in you, that they would find communities like this, a biblical community, a church to be a part of, to have that kind of prayer support and encouragement in the communities that they serve. So Father, across our nation, we pray on this day that you would uh, provide that spiritual protection, that spiritual uh, uh, need, uh, meet that spiritual need in every one of their lives, God. We pray, Father, for your hand to be upon the rest of our service and put your hand of favor upon us now as we look into your word the next few moments. And we just pray, God, that you would, would, Lord, speak into our lives and we 
that you would have our undivided attention right now and that we would be focused on you and you alone. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning once again. And I want to encourage you to take a Bible and turn with me to the book of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew is where we're going to be today. As we finished uh, the book of Acts last Sunday morning, we turn our attention just for the next few Sundays to a couple places we're going to go in the Word of God uh, that feel like the Lord has been leading me to, uh, bring all of us to. Uh, and one of those passages um, is going to be Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be looking this morning at Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 through 15. It's a passage familiar to many of us. If you're a Christian, uh, you're familiar with this passage. It has to do with the Lord's Prayer. We're going to look at prayer this morning. You know, I think it's, as you're turning there, I, I, I was thinking about this passage. I think it's, uh, it's interesting how something that seems, sometimes things that seem so easy to do, so easy to implement in our lives, become sometimes the things that are the most difficult to implement on a regular and on a more consistent basis. Uh, sometimes things that are, seem easy become very difficult. When I was a young boy, I remember, used to go fishing with my grandfather, my mother's father. We would go to this lake in West Virginia called Stevens Lake. It's where my grandfather, my grandparents were. It's where my mother's whole side of the family is from southern West Virginia. And there in Beckley, West Virginia, which is where they lived, we would go and visit from time to time. And when we would gather there um, with my grandparents, um, inevitably my grandfather from time to time would take me fishing on his little bass boat. And he came from humble means. He was a coal miner for many years, so he didn't, wasn't a rich and wealthy man. But the things that he loved the most, um, he tried to bring me in on. So whether that was playing little songs on his guitar or taking me fishing, that's what we did. And so we found ourselves fishing one day. And and one of the highlights of my time with my grandfather would be when he would take the boat out in the middle of the lake and he would look at me and he would say, you want to open it up? And y'all know what that means. And for a young boy getting behind, you know, a steering wheel and then getting to boom and just take off, that's a big deal. And I was a young boy at the time, I remember this, and so um, he promised me when we put out of the marina that, uh, that we would do that after we went fishing. So we get back into this little cove and we're, you know, we're going around and we're fishing in these little coves, and we get to the end where we're going to head back to the marina. It was mid-morning, late morning, and we're going to head back. We we're in this small arena, a small um, cove, rather, and he goes to start the engine, and he can't start it. It's just boom, boom. He can't get it started. So the more he tried, the more, uh, the, 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 the harder it was to get the engine started. And so it was a very simple bass boat, but he couldn't get the engine start. And so it was so frustrating that he would go out, and he would go... Um, he would, search, he would look at every little thing uh, that he wanted to look at and that he thought could get the engine running. Nothing, nothing would get the engine started. And so he had what, what we all have. If you have a boat, you have one of these, and that is a what? Trolling motor. And that's the only thing he had to get us moving. And so he put the trolling motor down in front of the boat, and so he had that capability, so we started. And of course, we're just puttering along. Um, and we get out of the cove, and we get kind of out into the middle of the lake, or we're starting to turn the corner only for someone to finally come by after about an hour or two and saw us in our desperation, tied us up, towed us back to the marina. And we get almost back to the marina, and uh, the man who towed us back, it looks at my grandfather, and he says, well, let's, let's look at this, this, and this, and this. And finally, what he didn't realize, my grandfather didn't realize, is that accidentally we had shut off the emergency fuel valve that cut the fuel to the engine. That was it. That was it. And so after all of that, we missed it altogether. Listen, I think something so simple like prayer, like what God tells us to, to, to be about when it comes to praying, seems so simple, and yet sometimes we overlook it. Sometimes we, we, it becomes so difficult for us to implement that into our lives. It seems easy to do, right? We just bow our heads, close our eyes, and we talk to God. But it, yet it seems sometimes very inconsistent in, for many of us. Maybe it's ineffective for many of us. It can grow to be ineffective in our lives. We can pray and pray and pray and talk to God, and, and, and yet it still fall flat. We can miss communion with God altogether, even though we sometimes pray. Jesus wants you to know how to pray. He wants you to know how to talk to him. Look at your Bibles in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to begin this morning 
We're there in verse 5. We're going to read through verse 15 today. Verse 5 says this, And when you pray, Jesus says, You must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who is in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debt debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Let's pray. Father, we do pray this morning that you would teach us to pray. Help us to learn as a church, help us to learn as individuals, help us to learn as families how to talk to you and commune with you and hear from you at the same time. And so help us to walk this life and learn how to pray in the way that Jesus taught us to pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. You know, Jesus is, is going to talk about this again. In fact, in Luke chapter 11, he's going to come back to this. But you see, his disciples, remember Jesus here in Matthew is speaking to his disciples, yes, but he's also speaking to the, the crowds of people that have gathered. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. But in, in Luke chapter 11, Jesus is going to come back to this again. He's going to teach his disciples how to pray again. The disciples had watched him pray Think about Jesus' ministry. If you read the Gospels, you know that Jesus would, would, would drift away at times. He would leave his disciples, and he would get alone with his Father in heaven. And he would be gone for an hour, half a day. He'd be gone for long periods of time, sometimes periods where he wanted to be alone, and then he would return to his disciples. And so the disciples saw this. They knew this. And so one of them, one day, got enough courage to go up to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, teach us to pray. Uh, in fact, over in Luke chapter 11, this is what it says. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, got the courage enough to say, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples, John the Baptist, who had taught his disciples how to pray. So Jesus then says what he just said, right? He gives us the model, Father, hallowed be your name, and, and on and on it goes. And they'd come to him, and they had... Um, wanted to know how to pray. Now, back here in Matthew chapter 6, chapter 5, and then in chapter 6, and chapter 6 in particular, here's what Jesus is doing. Jesus is, is going right at the heart of oftentimes the problem of human beings, of all of us, but in particular, the context of which the crowd was listening here on the mountainside when Jesus is teaching here in Matthew chapter 6. He's going to the heart of the problem, and the heart of the problem oftentimes is self-righteousness. It's elevating position and, and elevating status, coming out publicly and praying and, and being very highly religious and so that other people would see you and somehow pat you on the back. That's the backdrop here of what Matthew chapter 6 is all about. Jesus is teaching on this, and that's the backdrop to what he's saying. And it's in this backdrop that Jesus comes here in this passage, and he comes and he says to these folks, just as he says to us this morning, what God says to us is prayer done right yields the right reward. Prayer done right will yield the right reward reward. I want you to notice here that, that the focus here is not on, listen, it's not on the need to pray. Jesus isn't here going, hey, y'all pray, right? He's not saying that. Do you notice that? What does he say? When you pray. In other words, it's an expectation in the eyes of Jesus that those who are listening here on this particular day that he preaches this message and teaches this is that his focus is on praying the right way. You see, there's a wrong way to pray, and there is a right way to pray. And both yield a reward, one that's going to be a right reward, one that's going to lead to a wrong re reward. So listen, central, family. 
if you want to know how to pray the right way, if we want to know how to pray the right way, then pay attention here. We need to pay attention to the words of Jesus so that we might pray in the right way. What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what Jesus gets to. He gets to the right motive, right, in it, when it comes to praying. He, he gets to the right elements or the ingredients when it comes to our prayer life. The right motive, and he gets to the right ingredients. And then he gives us a reason on the back end to pray like this. So I want you to look in your Bibles at verse 5. We're going to walk through this together. He, he, Jesus teaches first and foremost how to pray with the right motive. Verse 5, 6, 7, and 8. Before he even gets to the model, he says, listen, don't pray like this, but pray like this. Before he gives you and I a template, before he gives you and I a model, he says, listen, you got to pray with the right motive. So in verse 5, and then in verse 6, and then in verse 7, there's this phrase that Jesus says, and when you pray. Prayer was a pillar of Jewish culture. They prayed in the morning, they had afternoon prayers, they prayed in the evening, right? And it was a pillar of Jewish culture. Not only was prayer, but almsgiving was a pillar. Uh, fasting was a, was a pillar. In fact, down in, we're not going to get to that this morning, but in, look at down at uh, verse 16. He says, and when you fast. In other words, he's assuming they're fasting. Like we are called as Christians to fast on a regular basis at different times. So the assumption, the expectation is not only is there prayer, but there be almsgiving and then fasting within the Jewish culture. It was all about the how and the why, however, that Jesus speaks about this topic right here in his message. He gets to motive. Then he goes after two groups. You notice that? Five, six, seven, and eight, verses five through eight. He goes after two groups. One is the what? Hypocrites in verse five. And then who else does he go after? He says, he, says, he points to the Gentiles in verse seven. So two groups he points out. He says, okay, don't pray like these people. He says, first and foremost, in verse five, don't pray for the applause of men like the hypocrites. See in verse five, don't play for the, or pray for the applause of men. Don't pray to get the uh, pat on the back. D don't pray publicly and, and, in a sense to where people look at you and think you are somehow holier or ri more righteous than another person to the where they look at you and they clap. Don't pray for the applause of men like hypocrites do. Also, don't pray. Look down at, at verse 7. Don't pray like Gentiles. Well, how do the Gentiles pray? For they think that they will be heard for their many words. You've got Gentiles, these who were pagans, and pagan people who didn't follow God, the God of the Old Testament, the God of Moses, right? But, but they followed multiple gods. So the Gentiles would, and, and pagan people would, would pray to multiple gods. They would say the names of false gods over and over again. Maybe they would recite things over and over and over and over again. But they prayed in such a way that make them feel better, if you will. They, and this is what Jesus says, don't pray to hear yourself pray mindlessly. Just to pray, to hear yourself pray. So don't pray for the applause of men. Don't pray to hear yourself pray. There's a wrong way, and that is the wrong way because it has the wrong motive. So then how are we to pray in the right way? Well, he answers that here in these few first few verses of what he's saying. He says, listen, if you want to pray the right way, then you pray, number one, publicly. It's okay to pray publicly. Jesus is not saying here, don't pray publicly. What we just did is not sin when you come with the right motive, right? He's saying we pray publicly, but also privately, secretly, and we pray thoughtfully. In other words, we pray when we get alone with God, when we get alone with our Heavenly Father, wherever you might be, whether you're in your truck, on your back porch, at home, alone, early in the morning, late at night, when no one's around, you pray secretly, but you also pray thoughtfully. What does that mean? Well, you come to God with a teachable spirit. You come not just to give him stuff to, that you want, but you come with a teachable spirit, a, a willing heart. You come with humility. You come with a way in which you approach him in a humble way, not in a way of pride. By the way, don't pr approach God, and we don't approach God with, with doubt. We approach him with faith. God, you can do this. God, you can work. God, you can move in these particular areas, in this particular arena of my life. You can work. We don't come with this, God, we want you to work. I need you to work. But if you don't work, I've got a plan B mentality. Right? That's not faith. Faith is, land. you leave it all on the line to God. You bring it to him and you say, listen, if you don't do it, it's not going to happen, God. 
if you don't move in this, it's not going to happen. We come with the right posture. We come publicly to pray. We come secretly to pray. We come thoughtfully to pray. At the end of the day, motive is something that's found in the heart, isn't it? The motive. I don't fear an investigator, but if you've worked with investigators in law enforcement, you understand that the motive is what the investigator's trying to get to when they're trying to investigate the defendant. They're trying to get to the motive of why that person would have done that, whether it's a shooting or whether it's a, uh, something, some particular felon, some particular felony, some particular egregious act that that person has already been proven to do. Why did they do it? Whenever we see these tragedies on TV, like what happened to Uvalde and other places, what, are, what is the first question people ask? Why? Why would it, what would it take for someone to do that? They're trying to get to motive. They're trying to get to what's inside that person's heart for why they would do it. You see, the reality is when it comes to motive in the Christian life, we can hide it, but God sees it. We can pray publicly. We can pray privately. We can pray secretly. We can pray, you know, with a group of people, but it's only God who peers and pierces into the human heart, and he sees what the motive is in which we come to him with if you're not giving attention to the heart, then things are going, you're going to spiritually drift, right? In other words, if you don't give attention to your gardens at home, what happens? If you don't give attention to your house or your home at, at your house, what begins to happen? The, the house begins to fall apart. The, 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 the house begins to get a little dirtier. Ours is a little less dirtier. We got two less in our household. Now, they're off at of college, but, but it still gets really dirty because we just got a puppy in our house, so there you go. But, but, but if we don't give attention to those things, then what's going to happen? It's going to start to drift, right? It's the same way with the human heart. We have to, to always weigh. We have to understand. We have to ask ourselves our question, what motive am I coming to the Lord with? Our, our prayer life, right, our praying life can be motivated out of pride, in other words, it can be when I come and approach God, I can come to him, you know, with a man-centered approach. Sometimes I can come to God and I can pray to him and it's only to help me or, want, or cause me to feel better. I mean, I really feel good if I just pray to God. I feel better that I wasn't praying and now that I am praying, I just prayed, it makes me feel good. Is that the approach we take? Maybe we feel spiritual guilt that we're not praying enough, and so we start to pray, and it makes us feel good, just, just feel good that we prayed. Is that the motive of my heart? Right? We can come, sometimes if we're not careful, we begin to drift over into this man-centered, prideful praying instead of a humble approach towards God. Our prayer life can also be motivated by religion. The fact of the matter is we can come and we can say, or we can come with the wrong motive, we can receive the wrong reward like the Gentiles here do, and, and, and also like the, uh, uh, the, the Pharisees, or rather the hypocrites do, like they, they receive the reward they were looking for, the pat on the back, the <laughs> applause of men, right? They can receive these things, they can come with the wrong motive, they can receive the wrong reward, and they can miss God altogether, Listen, church, we can, uh, we can miss God altogether even though we can pray, even though we ask God for things, even though we gather together and we pray. The motive matters. It matters in how we approach God. The goal in praying is not to get the applause of man. The goal in praying is not to somehow make me feel good about myself. The motive is to pray, and it leads to intimacy with God. That's the motive of prayer. The motive is that when I come to the Lord, I come just like Jesus did. Jesus gets away. He prays with his heavenly Father. And the night of which he is betrayed, the night before he goes to the cross, what does Jesus do? He takes these small band of disciples and he takes them all the way to the Garden of where? Gethsemane. There you go. Some of you know it. And he gets them to the Garden of Gethsemane and he says, okay, y'all stay right here and do what? Watch and pray with me. I'm going to go over here and pray with my heavenly Father. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to spend time with his heavenly father. It wasn't to make him feel better. It wasn't to somehow uh, receive the applause of men. It wasn't that he was there and the disciples so that he would, he would say, y'all look at me, watch me. I'm going to go over here. When I get down, I'm going to look back and see if you're staring at me. No, he wasn't doing any of those things. He wanted to be with his father. He, he wanted to have that intimacy with his heavenly father. Listen, God sees you and I in secret. 
He, he knows your needs before you ever bring them to him. So why bring them to him? He already knows what you need. He already knows what our church needs. He already knows what your marriage needs. He already knows what your family needs. But he wants you to want him to move and to act. We get this intimacy with him because we get to join into this personal relationship that we have with him. And listen, church, prayer done right leads to the right reward. What he wants to say, what he wants to do, that's what it gets to. That's intimacy with God. He wants you to be in a posture to where he gets to have a say-so. He gets to have the only say-so in your life. He gets to have the only say-so in our church. He gets to have the only say-so in your family and in your marriage. This isn't a co-equal kind of relationship. It's not you and him co-equally uh, having authority in your life. He wants you to want him. He gets to say and do anything he wants to do in your life. We come with the right motive. Jesus taught his disciples. He said, and when you pray, don't be like these two groups. <clears throat> Instead, be like, be, be like this. He says, truly I say to you, they receive their reward. Father sees in secret, will reward you. No. Look at verse 6, or rather, yeah, verse 8. 6 and verse 8. Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. Your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Verse 8, do not be like them, for your Father's knees knows what you need before you ask him. He knows what you and I need, but he chooses, he wants us to come with the right motive. So Jesus teaches us to pray with the right motive, but he also gives us the right ingredients, gives us the right template, if you will, uh, the right elements, if you will, to bring about in our lives. Then he gets to the template, right, in verse 9. Through verse 13, he shows us here what kind of a template to use. I'm reminded of what the Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. This is what Paul says to the church. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Continue steadfastly in prayer, church, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. What does he mean by that? Paul says to be constant in it. Jesus says, okay, here's how you be constant in it. And this is the model of which he gives to us. Listen, by the way, this isn't to be necessarily memorized and just, just recited. I played college football and high school football and all that. And I'll never forget being in college. My coach was, he, he had a particular faith uh, that he belonged to. And he would always get the team together and we'd get in. We'd get on one knee. Y'all know where I'm going with this, right? We'd get down and we'd say, our Father, Lord heaven, hallowed be your name. It's always start out slow. And by the end of it, we're like yelling and screaming our heads off at God. I don't really think we were actually praying, but it just got us all worked up and ready to go. And we, we stood up and we were ready to run through a brick wall out on the football field. That's not what God's saying here that we ought to take and implement into our lives. It's mindless. That's mindless. You know, we come and we learn. We understand what God is saying here. And we understand that there are these six requests that Jesus lays here before us. We're just going to walk through them kind of rather quickly this morning. But there are three here that are directed towards God, and then there are three directed towards our needs. And I want you to see this. What God says here, for Jesus says, first of all, he says, pray then like this, our Father in heaven. That's where we start. Our Father in heaven. See, here's the thing that I want you to be reminded of this morning. God has invited you and I into this personal relationship with him, this personal time of worship with him. I love it. And think about what it says in Psalm 100, verse 4. The psalmist says, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Man, just think about that. God gives you and I an opportunity to come into this moment or this time to pray to the creator of all things, the creator of the universe, the creator of everything, the creator of my life, the one who knows the future, the one who understands my past, the one who understands what I'm going through right now, what I went through 10 years ago, when I went through that season of my life, he has, uh, has a complete and clear understanding of who I am and I have this personal relationship with him. Now listen, let me just pause right here. 
Because in order to understand how to have a personal relationship with God and to understand how to enjoy this relationship, you've got to be a follower of Jesus Christ himself. Right? None of this works without understanding who Jesus is and understanding what God has done for you. And listen, in a room like this, there are those of us in this room, and I'm convinced that some of us maybe have grown, become religious. Maybe you've gone to churches, maybe you've brought your Bibles, maybe you've come to this church for a long period of time, or maybe you've gone to various churches, or someone's invited you to come, but maybe you've not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, and you look at these three this morning, and you look at the testimony on the screen, and you think, listen, I, I don't fully understand that world Listen, what God wants for you, first and foremost, before you understand how to pray the way Jesus wants us to pray, to where it's effective and it's impactful, is that we allow him to be the Savior and the Lord of our lives. The Bible says you're cut off from God because of your sin. And God remedied that by sending his son into the world. The Bible is very clear, right? That all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that the wages of sin is eternal death, it's spiritual death being cut off from God for all of eternity when I die. But God has given you this window of opportunity to know him, to receive him, to give him, uh, allow him to sit on the throne of your heart in your life and you get dethroned and you allow him to be the savior and Lord of your life. And everything he did on the cross and from the grave then is applied to your life. And then you go get baptized, right? These three did this morning. But you've got to understand that God's first and foremost, he calls us into this intimate relationship with him through prayer, but he begins first and foremost when I've allowed Jesus to be my Savior and my Lord. Listen, you'll have an opportunity to do that at the end of the service when we have a time of response to what God says. But look, Christians, when it comes back to this and I understand what God is saying here, what Jesus is saying here, he says, first of all, our Father who is in heaven. So first and foremost, there's this personal relationship I have with my heavenly Father. Then we get to the requests. There's six of them, three that are upward, uh, the three that are directed towards God, three that are directed towards our needs. Number one, let your name be made great, where he says, hallowed be your name. Think of one of the ways in which God describes himself to us in the Bible is by way of his name. There are many names in the Bible in which God names himself, Yahweh. One is called Jehovah Jireh. You know, this Hebrew name of God is Jehovah Jireh. You know what that means? Provider. So when I think about the names of God, when I read the Bible and I think about who he is and what he has done, I say, hallowed be your name. I put your name in a very high, high position in my life, right? Make your name great in my life. Make your name great in my home. Make your name great in my church, in my community. Hallowed be your name. You're Jehovah Jireh. You're the one who provides, right? Hallowed be your name. Number two, your kingdom come, right? Have you asked him for anything yet? No, your focus is on him because he's the, he's the focus of your prayer life, right? You give him the credit that he deserves, the worship that you get to worship him with. Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, right? That, that the Lord Jesus, that God, you would gain ground here in my heart, in my home, in my community, that you would gain ground in the world, that more and more people would come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord, that your kingdom would grow, that people would come to faith in Jesus Christ here in Livingston, that your people would come to faith in Christ in Polk County, here in Texas, around this country, that people would turn to Jesus Christ. Your kingdom come. You remake how we think about our lives. You remake how I'm doing in my marriage. You remake how we do government. You remake how we think about uh, uh, social issues in our day and age. You remake your kingdom come, right? Your kingdom come. But he's not done. Your what? Will be done, right? In verse 10, on earth as it is in heaven. One of the ways in which you can pray God's will into reality is what? What is God's will? It's right here. This is God's will for your life, your individual life. This is God's will for your marriage. You want to know how to have a healthy and vibrant marriage? Right here. If you want to know how to help have a healthy and vibrant relationship with your kids? Right here. How to be godly parents and raise them the way God wants you to raise them? Right here. You want to know how to be a healthy and vibrant and flourishing local church? 
We do, right? It's right here. We get our marching orders right here. We understand how to live our lives right here. This is our nourishment, right? He is the bread of life. Jesus himself says that, right? He's also, it also says in John 1, the word became what? Flesh and dwelt among us. We receive him as saving Lord. He is the cornerstone of our church. We understand that. Your will be done. The will of God is the word of God. So we then pray. We pray things like for our homes and for our families. Here's one for, your, for our church. Just think about this in Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May his face shine upon us. That your way may be known on earth. Your saving power among the nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We pray that on behalf of our church here at Central. Right, that God would make our congregation a bright, shining light that would broadcast and light up our community, light up Polk County, light up the nations of the world through our congregation, right? That we pray that on our behalf because we are the bride of Christ. We are a local church that God has changed and transformed and is changing and is transforming, right? Your will be done in us not just as a church, but in me, in you, in our homes, in our families, because we are the church, amen? So we have these three things that Jesus shows us how to pray for, and they're all directed towards him, right? Your name be made great, hallowed be your name. Your, uh, you know, your kingdom come there in verse 10. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, verse, verse 10, the latter part of verse 10. Then, it, then they're directed towards my needs, I mean, look at verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. We, Lord, need your provision. That's what it's saying. Jesus says, then ask him for things. We need him. We need the things he wants for us. He is our heavenly father. And listen, dads, do you know what's best for your kids? All the dads out there go. Do your kids think they know what's best for their lives? Yeah, they do. But do they know what's best for their lives? Who knows what's best for their lives? You do, right? So as our heavenly father knows what's best for us. He sees into our lives. He knows what we need. Sometimes we need discipline. Sometimes he needs to allow us to fail and fall so that we would trust him again and get back up and by faith keep walking forward, right? We need his provision in our life. Give us this day our daily bread. There's so much more we could get into there. But we need your provision, Lord. We need your restoration, Lord. We need forgiveness of sin. Look at it, what it says. Give us this day our daily bread, verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And we need to be forgiven for our sins. We need, we, we need to confess and repent of our sins, right? We need that restoration in our life. Paul says to the church in Ephesus, great passage he speaks to, and he says very, very simply, uh, as it pertains to um, how they were living among one another, he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but whom you were, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander be put away from you. It's gone. It's gone. Along with all malice. Replace it with this. Verse 32, Ephesians 4. Be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another. As God in Christ forgave you. And we need restoration. We need the Lord to restore us, but we also need to implement that among people around us, right? We also need his spiritual protection. Look at verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God will certainly test your life, but he will not tempt your life, but he will test you in many, many, many ways. You see, praying the right way the right motive, the right ingredients. It's going to yield the right reward. And there's a reason for praying this, and this is where Jesus goes in verse 14 and 15. It says, for you forgive, for if you forgive, the for meaning it's tied to what he just said, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, 
neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Jesus said, makes forgiveness and takes it and makes it central to effective praying. Notice that? Verse 14 and 15, he cherry-picked forgiveness and he put it at the center of an effective prayer life. Yikes. Why would he do that? Listen, you can pray with the right motive. You, you can pray with the right ingredients. You can even recite this. You can come with a sincere heart, but if you don't have forgiveness in your heart towards people who have wronged you and you're carrying deep bitterness into that prayer closet, it's going to be a barrier. It's going to be a hindrance. I mean, if you carry animosity towards someone in our congregation or someone who's left our congregation or someone who has deeply harmed you or hurt you in your life, if you carry bitterness around with you and then you come to him and you seek him and you pray to him, it's going to be a barrier. Someone who may have deeply harmed you and you have every right maybe in your life to not want to give and, and issue forgiveness to that person, Jesus says, you forgive them. So how do I forgive them? Well, you forgive them by the power of God who enables you to forgive them. Because as human beings, we are unable to do that at times. But by way of the power of God, we can. So there have been people in my life that have deeply harmed me, slandered me, harmed me, maybe physically been abusive in different ways when I was younger as a kid on a football team or whatever I was in the middle of. There have been people who have deeply harmed maybe my parents in ministry in other ways, but it fell to me during those seasons coming out of that to forgive those people and to move on from it, right? And to begin to love the way God wants us to love. If you forgive others, you, won't, you, you, you will be met with you may not be met with forgiveness if you've even harmed someone else. That's okay. But if you forgive, then you receive forgiveness yourself. It's not a formula here that Jesus is getting at. But listen, forgiveness is a sign of the grace of God in your life and in my life. I'm going to go back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. It says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as Jesus Christ forgave you. So prayer done right yields the right reward. I love this author. His name is Paul Miller. We're going to be done in a moment. But he says this. He says, learning to pray doesn't offer you a less busy heart, uh, or a busy life, rather. It offers you a, li- a less busy heart. Prayer done right, the right motive, the right ingredients, doesn't offer you a less busy life. We're all busy. But it will offer you a less busy heart. We're busy, we struggle. Sometimes prayer is uncomfortable. Why? Because sometimes we think it's that we're really kind of wasting our time because there's nothing happening. But pray. Devote yourself to pray. I want to give you this morning a tool to take with you. You don't have it, and you may not have it this morning, but it is out at our information desk. And here's what I want to call our church to do. Over the next 30 days, we're going to pray as a church. And we're going to pray, we're going to read, and we're going to pray the exact same thing. So as a congregation, in your homes, in your marriages, as individuals, there's a 30-day prayer guide I've put together for you, and it starts tomorrow, September the 12th. And for 30 days, we are going to pray this little prayer guide. Every day you're going to get a a, a verse of scripture or a small little passage. I want you to read the passage and then pray for the one or two quick things to pray for. Okay? Can you do that with me? We're going to pray together, and we're going to pray the right things. We're going to pray the same things, rather, and we're going to be praying the same things towards the same God. Are you with me? 30 days. Let's pray into the month of October, over the course of the month of September, starting tomorrow morning, as individuals, on your own, in your homes, in your households, wherever you are, take this little booklet with you. You can get it as you're leaving today at the information desk, and let's pray together. As a church, we'll be praying in our congregation, of course, in our worship services, but let's pray together. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. As our worship team comes forward, um, they are going to lead us in a song, and as you heard me a moment ago, 
Listen, if you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, I'll be here at the front. We'll be willing to talk to you about giving your life to Christ and helping you with that decision. But there are other decisions that God calls us to as a church. One of those is joining a local church. God wants you to be a part of a local church. If you attend here and you consider Central Baptist your home, then you need to join us so that you have that kind of protection over your life and you can also do what God wants you to do here in the life of his church, Central Baptist. So y'all need to think about that, pray about that, make that decision to give your to give your, your, yourself to our congregation and church membership. Maybe God's calling you to be baptized. You watch those who have been baptized the last two Sundays. They come for different reasons. Some came for salvation. Maybe some came, and I have baptized many, who got it out of the wrong order. Maybe they were young when they were baptized, and they didn't know what they were doing. They got saved later in life. God says that we are to be believers, follow through with believers' baptism. Maybe it's out of order. And maybe that's what you need to do. You need to be baptized. God calls us to that. He calls us to many things. But I believe what God's calling us to is to prayer. So as a congregation, let's commit to pray this morning. For the next 30 days, for the same things, reading the same passages from his word, see what God does. Let's see what God does. I'm going to pray. We're going to stand and we're going to sing together. You have the courage to come this morning if God is leading you to do so. Father, thank you this morning for your word, for your challenge, for your encouragement. Teach us to pray as Jesus taught us to pray in your word. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand with me and let's sing. Thank you for tuning in to one of our services. We would love to invite you if you're ever in the Livingston area to worship with us. We're located at 503 Northeast Avenue in Livingston, Texas. Here at Central Baptist, we are an intergenerational body of baptized believers with a blended style of praise who value expositional preaching, meaningful membership, consistent discipleship across all ages, and a gospel emphasis both locally and globally. If you'd like more information about Central, please visit our website at centrallivingston.com. Once again, thank you and have a blessed day.